Hello again, everyone. In this video, I'm going to show you guys all about how to set up your own retro gaming system with Raspberry Pi 4 and the latest version of RetroPie. I've done a video like this in the past with Tom Lawrence, and I wanted to update it now that a new version of both the Raspberry Pi and RetroPie are available. I just thought it would be a great idea to have an updated build video, so that's what we're going to take care of in this video. Now, this is a full tutorial. I'm going to show you guys the entire process of setting up your RetroPie, all the way from the initial build, all the way to setting up the SD card and adding ROMs, basically everything you'll need to know. In fact, this is the finished product right here. I'm going to show you what to buy and how to build it, everything you need to know, and this is basically what you're building right here. It's going to be awesome. And I'm going to be doing this a little bit different than most. Rather than split this up into a bunch of smaller tutorials, I'm putting everything in this one video with time codes down in the description. So if you want to skip a particular section and go right to the thing that you want to know or the section that is most applicable to where you are in the process, you could go ahead and do that. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Now, in this section of the video, I'm going to talk to you guys about what you can reasonably expect from the Raspberry Pi 4 to set your expectations accordingly. Some systems are harder to emulate than others. Some things this platform does very well. Other things are a little bit beyond the reach of a Raspberry Pi in what it's capable of with its resources. So, first of all, the general rule of thumb is pretty much most of the systems that you would want to run from the 90s and earlier are going to run fairly well. Now there's some, you know, exceptions there. Sega Saturn has been harder to run. PlayStation for me has run very well. Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis, or Mega Drive, as you guys call it in other parts of the world, runs just fine. The 32X, that works fine as well. Sega CD has worked fine for me. I've tried PC Engine, PC Engine CD, I've had success with that. Game Boy, Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance, Game Gear, those are extremely easy to run. Regular Nintendo or Famicom in other parts of the world, Super NES, that, you know, those systems actually run very well in addition. So if you are generally going to be running something that's 16-bit, it's going to probably run very well. Check the documentation if you're at all concerned about what it will or won't do. But if you are just trying to run 8 or 16-bit games, it's probably going to run just fine. Which means if you are trying something like N64, it may work. It may work well with some tweaking, but it's not going to be a set it and forget it kind of system. N64 is a little bit of a challenge. Dreamcast, same thing. That's a challenge. Some games will run well. Others, maybe not so much. PSP, for the most part, should run fine on a Pi 4. There's going to be some edge cases. So basically, the more recent the system, the harder it's going to be to emulate, which means a PlayStation 2, probably not. PlayStation 3, not going to happen. So just wanted you guys to know what you can reasonably expect. In my experience, Super Nintendo, Sega, PlayStation, 32X, Sega CD, all the handheld systems, they work wonderfully. So if that's what you're trying to do, then you're all set. And then your results may vary if you go beyond that. I think that's the best rule of thumb. So in the next section, what I'm going to do is show you guys what you need to buy, and I'm going to show you guys some recommendations. I'll do some unboxing of various components, and then after that, I'll show you guys how to build it. So in this part of the video, I'm going to answer the question, what do you need in order to get started? What do you need to go and buy in order to get this project going? So I have some stuff right here that I'm going to be unboxing and I'm going to tell you about the various things that you need in order to get started. So first of all, we have the Raspberry Pi. You'll obviously need a Raspberry Pi board. That's the most important part of this. 
Now RetroPie can be installed on a PC. I have a separate video for that, but this video is all about building your own retro gaming system that's based on the Raspberry Pi 4, which is exactly what I have here. This is the two gigabyte version, but the four gigabyte version is fine. You're not gonna benefit from the four gigabyte version. You may as well save a little bit of money and get the two gigabyte version if all you intend to use it for is RetroPie. So let's go ahead and get this unboxed. I'm a little impatient here, but let's go ahead and get this out of the box here. And then nothing too surprising. If you've ever seen a Raspberry Pi, then you know exactly what to expect. Again, this is the Raspberry Pi 4 board right here. So we got that. So let's go ahead and move on to the next component. And then here we have a case. Now the case is optional. It's definitely good to have a case, but you don't need a case in order to use RetroPie. It might look a little weird by your TV with just a circuit board essentially on your TV stand. A case is kind of like for appearance basically, but this one also has a safe shutdown feature which allows you to toggle the shutdown mechanism from the power button in the back of the case. And that's great because you don't have to manually shut it down. And that's something that I highly recommend. This is not required, but highly recommended. Now there are other cases available, but this is the one that I decided to go with. I use this on my own RetroPie, so essentially I'm building another one. So I'll get this out of the box here. We have anything but this screwdriver, but I think this will do the trick. Get the tape off here. And we have a little instruction book. Don't worry, I'll go ahead and show you the setup of this case, but definitely keep this for your reference. Then we have the case itself. And here it is. This is the actual case right here. And I'm going to go over this in more detail in the build section of the video, but it's pretty easy to put it together. When you go ahead and lift it, you have some components right here that's going to be needed for the setup. It's all included. And we have a built-in fan, which I'm going to show you right here, which is going to help keep it cool, which is pretty neat. And then the power button is actually going to be on the back, which is right here. And that's what you'll use to turn it on and also to turn it off. And then it's going to expose your ports in the back as well. So this is a pretty cool case. And I'll return to the case in just a moment. Now here we have some controllers. You'll need at least one gamepad or controller to get started. This actually came with two and they're wireless. So this is actually new, something that I just decided to check out. I thought it'd be pretty neat to build a RetroPie with two controllers that are wireless. And if you want to save some money, you could go with something cheap like this controller from RetroFlag. It's a wired USB controller. It is a really good one. I really like this one. I like the freedom of being wireless, basically. But this is a good controller to go with if, it, if you're on the cheap. I'm not going to do an unboxing, obviously, because I just had this lying around. But they're about, I think, $12 or $15. I'll have links to everything in the description below. But if you want something inexpensive, this is a good one to get started with. Another controller you may consider is this one right here. This is the SN30 Pro Plus. I love this controller. If you are going to be playing like PlayStation games or games with analog support, something like that, this is a great choice. I like this one a lot. It's Bluetooth, so it's wireless. The only problem is, Setting up Bluetooth controllers in RetroPie is a little finicky. It's not really hard, but it's just going to be, it's going to be a little involved. It takes a few tries to get it right. It's not that bad. Once you get it set up, you're pretty much good to go, and Bluetooth is awesome. But if you want to go with Bluetooth and have something more premium or something with analog joysticks, this is the one that I recommend. I like this controller a lot. Like I mentioned, it's definitely a great choice. But for the purposes of this video here, I'm going to show you guys this set of wireless controllers. And these are the ones that we are going to be using for our project today. Now the controllers you see here that I'll be unboxing is by a company called Zito. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I'll have links in the description below, like I mentioned. And these cost me about $40. It looks like the price is normally $60, but as of the time I ordered it, I only had to pay $40, which is pretty cheap considering both of them are wireless. Now they're 2.4 gigahertz wireless, they're not Bluetooth, but they should work just fine. 
So let's go ahead and get it out of the box. And I did take the seal off. I promise I didn't open it though. And here we have one of the game pads. So I had to show you guys what it looks like. So, you know, it's a very standard game pad. It's not going to have as high a build quality as the 8-bit do SN30 controller I just showed you. But they feel solid and the buttons, you know, they don't feel maybe as great as a real Super Nintendo controller. But darn close. I think this is going to be fine. It doesn't feel super light. It feels, you know, it feels just right. I think this will be fine. The D-pad feels nice. So this is a good solution if you want to, again, have wireless controllers and, you know, you don't want to buy two SN30 controllers. This might be a good option. So here we have some peripherals. We have a dongle. And I'll go ahead and get this out of here. So this can be used with the um, SNES Classic essentially. So if you have an SNES Classic, that's why we have this little dongle here that allows you to use it for that. That's obviously not what we will use it for, but what we will use is this little USB dongle right here that we will be plugging into our RetroPie to facilitate the wireless. And of course we also have this charging cable that it comes with as well. Um, it's just a USB cable, so nothing too surprising there. And then, of course, we have, like I mentioned, two of them in this box. We get some instructions, and then here we have the second controller. So we have both of the controllers here. So, again, definitely worth a shot if you guys want to get wireless controllers on the cheap. And then, finally, one last thing you will need is a power cord. And I had this one lying around. It's a USB-C power cord. That's what the Raspberry Pi 4 uses. You will definitely need a power cord. And not just any power cord, you basically need one that's rated for the Pi 4. There was an issue with the build quality of the Pi 4 where some chargers didn't work. But they actually did fix it in a newer version of the Pi 4. But if you order a Pi 4, I don't know which one you will get, if yours will be the new revision or not. I think it's better just to say get a Raspberry Pi 4 certified power cord from Amazon so that way you don't have to worry about it. You know it's going to be the right one. And that's what I have here. I have a bunch of these lying around. So of course no unboxing, but it's just a power cord. But you get the idea. You need a power cord in order to provide your RetroPie console with power. So there we go. So I almost forgot something very important. Since the Raspberry Pi 4 doesn't have a full-size HDMI port, you're going to need an adapter or a micro HDMI to full-size HDMI cable. What I have right here is an adapter. This one adapts micro HDMI to full-size HDMI. So you can find these on Amazon pretty easily, and even your local stores might have these as well. So you'll need something like this in order to get it connected to your TV. If you follow the link in the description below this video, you'll find a link to my affiliate store, which will have a link to this as well as other items that I've gone over in this video. So as you can see, my desk is an absolute mess. But in this section of the video, I'm gonna go ahead and show you how to put all of this stuff together and build the actual unit I'll show you guys the case, how to install the Pi 4 board, and get everything set up. So let's go ahead and move on. So here we have the case. And what I'm going to do right now is show you guys how to put the Pi 4 board inside the case. So we'll put this top section aside for now. We have these two little baggies. So in this one right here, I can get it open. Essentially what we have is a daughter board of sorts that's going to plug into the Raspberry Pi itself. So let's go ahead and take care of that. So here's the board. Again, this is the Raspberry Pi 4. And what we're going to do is, well, basically just like this. We're going to plug the daughter board right into the side and gently push it in so that all of the connections are nice and tight, as you can see here. So it basically just makes the Pi 4 a bit longer and just extends the ports which are going to basically help the ports reach the appropriate section inside the case. So basically you just go ahead and attach that. Now we have another baggie here, so we'll go ahead and open this and this is going to have the screws and also the thermal pads that we will need to complete the setup. 
a little clumsy, but just trying to get everything out of the baggie here. So we have rubber feet for the bottom of the case. Put that aside. Here are the two thermal pads. There's actually two of them here, as I'll show you. And these are going to help the thermals make proper connectivity to the case itself between the case and the Pi board. So that's actually what we're going to do first is get that installed. And the way we'll do it is we'll get this top portion of the case, flip it over, and you see we have these two right here, these two square or a rectangle and a square. Actually, they're both rectangles. Anyway, you have these two things. And we're going to put the thermal pads directly on these. Now, there's going to be two sides of the thermal pad that have plastic. So you definitely don't want to put this in with one of the two plastics there. We want to get that removed. So first of all, I just remove one side here. And then we'll go ahead and put it down. And we're basically just putting it onto the board right here. Make sure it's nice and tight. And then there's going to be another layer of plastic. And this is a little off center. Let me fix that. And then we try to gently separate the plastic from the top right here, which can be a little challenging. So I'll just try my fingernail. There it goes. Now we have both of the plastic protective layers removed. And then we're going to go ahead and get the other piece right here. We're going to do the exact same thing here. It could be a little challenging to separate it. Just keep working at it and eventually it will. Do the same thing again. You see we kind of have it right here. And feel free to trim this if you'd like to uh, make sure that there's nothing hanging out off the sides. And it's a little challenging. I'm trying not to destroy the thermal pads in the process, but now we have both of the thermal pads here. So I'm going to try my best to kind of trim this down a little bit. And then here we go. I mean, this is a pretty pathetic attempt, to be honest. So, you know, I'm sure you guys will do a much better, more pristine job than me. So anyway, we're just trying to make sure there's not too much hanging off the sides of the, uh, you know, the standoffs here. So now that we have that done, we could go ahead and insert the Raspberry Pi to the board. And it should be pretty self-explanatory. We have this section right here for the GPIO pins, and then we have the GPIO pins right here. We're essentially going to match that. Looks like I have something hanging off here. Get, get rid of that. So anyway, what we're going to do is essentially just, well, we're going to push this down. And what we want to do is try to, let's see if I get it in frame, line up the GPIO pins right where the case is. So we basically just push this in. Make sure it's lined up so we don't touch the thermal pads until we're ready to push that down, make sure everything is lined up. It's really hard to do with recording lights in my face here. I'm just going to gently push it together, make sure all the ports are basically lined up and flush with the case so it could be a little tight here. Just keep working at it, push it in and just check to make sure everything is lined up. So far so good. And now, when it comes to the screws, some right here, four of these screws are going to be a bit shorter. So if I kind of just put this in focus, you can see one screw is much shorter than the other. So we're going to get four of these, four of the shorter ones. Those are the ones that we're actually going to use for this next step, where we will be screwing the board directly into the case. So I'll go ahead and just turn this around here. You'll need a screwdriver, obviously. And we'll go ahead and start putting the screws onto the board. So we'll put one here. Another one right here. One right here. And the final one right here. I'll just put that in focus a little bit. You can see where the screws are. And we simply tighten them down. And now we have this part done. And then finally, we grab the bottom portion, which I have right here. 
And then what we're going to do is go ahead and put the bottom portion on. So basically we have this curved side right here so we know exactly where it needs to go. And it should just fall right down and just kind of sit on there. It doesn't really snap in, it's just, you know, kind of wobbly. But what will secure it in place are these longer screws, the ones that we have left over. So we will use those to finish this process. And of course we simply tighten those down just like this. Then you basically give it a once over, just have a look around at the unit, make sure everything is flush. And it's pretty much built. We have these rubber feet right here. We'll just simply uh, tear these off here, put them in the recessed areas. And as you can see, we're pretty much good to go. The unit is now built. We are ready almost to get this thing turned into a gaming system. I mean, it already looks pretty sweet. I mean, look at this case. I think this case is just plain awesome. It looks kind of futuristic. There's actually gonna be some LED lights right here that'll show uh, disc activity. The SD card will slide in right there. And then we actually have all of the ports exposed here on the back. Again, there's a power button. So this will be a great case to use for this project. And in the next section of the video, I'm going to show you guys how to set up the SD card because as great as this is, it's completely useless without an operating system. You can plug it in, but absolutely nothing will happen until we get the SD card set up. And that's what we're gonna do in the next section. So stick with me and we'll get that done too. Okay, so at this point in the video, guys, I'm going to show you how to install RetroPie, which is required to get our new gaming system booted up and ready to go. Now, you'll need an SD card for this, and I talked about that earlier in the video, and then you'll need some kind of way of inserting that SD card into your computer, whether it be via a USB card reader or maybe you have an SD card slot on your actual computer itself. Either way, you'll go ahead and insert it. I have mine right here that I'll use as my example. And then you can use your Windows, PC, your Mac, your Linux PC, whatever you have to go ahead and flash the RetroPie image onto the SD card. And I'm going to show you how to do that right now. So what you're going to do is open up your web browser. And then you'll go to this website right here, Belena or Belena, Belena? I don't know, Belena.io slash etcher. The Etcher tool will allow you to basically flash the RetroPie image directly onto your SD card. And the reason why I like this tool is because it works the same regardless if you have a PC, a Mac, or like me, you're running on Linux, it's the same for each. So if you scroll down, it'll automatically detect your operating system, and then you simply go ahead and click on it to download the utility. I'll go ahead and save it. Then we'll let that download. In addition to that, you'll also need, and by the way, I will have the links in the description below the video, but you'll also need RetroPie itself. So you'll go to the RetroPie website, also linked below, and click on the download button. And if you scroll down, you'll have several download buttons here. Now I'm showing you guys how to set this up on a Raspberry Pi 4. But if you only have a Raspberry Pi 3, for example, then you'll want this one right here. But if you are starting from scratch in 2020 or beyond or however long until we have a Raspberry Pi 5, you're definitely gonna want the Raspberry Pi 4 version and the Raspberry Pi 4 board for the best experience. So since I have a Raspberry Pi 4, I'm also going to choose this option right here. So I'll download that. And it's gonna be a fairly large file here. So I'll go ahead and click the save button here and we'll go ahead and let that download. Okay, so now that we have both files downloaded, what you'll do is open up the file manager for your operating system. I'm on Pop! OS, so I have the files utility open here. 
But of course, in macOS, you have Finder and you have Explorer on Windows, whatever that happens to be. You just basically open up whatever the location is for your downloads, and you should have two files named similarly. Now, obviously, I'm on Linux, so if you're on Windows, the file name might be different for this. And the Linux equivalent here is an app image file, so I'm going to go ahead and unzip this. So I'll click Extract here in my case for the Etcher utility. And if you double click on there, you should have an application. So if you're on Linux like I am, you'll right click, go to Properties, Permissions, and make sure Allow Executing as a Program is selected. Now if you are on Mac OS or Windows, you'll just probably double click on it after you extract it and it should open it up. So I'll double click on it myself. And the utility is open. Now basically what you'll do is you will select the file that you downloaded for RetroPie. So I'll click on the button, and then navigate to wherever you saved the RetroPie image from a previous step, and that's it right here. For the Pi 4, the file name will be, or similar to, RetroPie Buster, in this case version 4.6, but they're always coming out with new versions. And with that selected, we'll click Open. And now it asks us to select a target. Now I'm going to go ahead and insert the uh, actual SD card. And there it is. We can ignore what it says about the size here because I was already using that for RetroPie, which makes it look a little bit different. Anyway, I'll select the target. And you wanna definitely make sure that you choose the appropriate SD card for your RetroPie install because this will erase everything on the SD card completely. So you want to make sure that this is an SD card that is dedicated to this project. So I'll select it and then click continue. And then this flash button should light up right here. So I'll go ahead and click on it. So I'm getting an error here that's warning me that this is an unusually large SD card, which is a very silly warning because large SD cards are very, very common nowadays, especially if you are trying to emulate something like uh, PS1 that has very large ROM sizes. It's going to be very common for something like this to be large. Just make sure that you did select the right SD card because again, it's going to completely wipe it out and then click continue. Now you may get an administrator prompt or equivalent depending on what your operating system is to make changes to the SD card. So I'll just simply put in my password. And it's going to go ahead and write the image to the SD card and convert it into a bootable device for RetroPie. So there we go. The flashing process is complete. We can go ahead and eject the SD card and insert it into our new gaming system. We should be ready to go ahead and boot it up. So we prepared the SD card, it's ready to go, and then we can go ahead and insert the SD card into our game system here and get it powered up. So you'll go ahead and connect the power cable, and if you are using one of the wireless controllers that I mentioned earlier in the video, then you'll also plug in one of the dongles for that as well, and then you should be able to press the power button in the back. Make sure you have an HDMI cable inserted before you press the power button, because the screen can look a little weird if you actually turn it on before inserting the HDMI cable. If that happens, you just simply restart it. And then you should be presented with a screen that is asking you to set up the controller, which is exactly what we're gonna do in this section. And once everything has started up, you should see a screen that looks like this. That's basically asking you to go ahead and configure your controller. If you are using the wireless game pads that I showed off near the beginning of the video, then the first thing you're going to have to do is pair the controller to the dongle. So what you'll do is you'll plug in one of the two dongles because you'll want to program the controllers one at a time. So if you're using the same controller as me to go ahead and start the pairing process, you basically grab the controller and hold up, select, and start at the same time. You hold those three buttons for about a second and you'll notice that the light on the top of the controller will start blinking, which means you are in pairing mode. And then when it goes steady, that means that the controller is paired and ready to go.
And then what you do to go ahead and start the process of programming the gamepad for use with RetroPie, you'll go ahead and hold a button on the gamepad to go ahead and start that process. So I'll just hold down the A button here. And then you'll see this screen right here, which is basically asking you to go ahead and program your controller. So for every button that it's asking you to press, you simply press that button on the gamepad. So what I'll do is go ahead and press the buttons on the gamepad that correspond to what I see on the screen. And if you are using a Super Nintendo style controller like I am, that's pretty easy because the actual button names do match up to what you see on the screen. But if you're using something that is not in this format, you could go ahead and refer to the RetroPie documentation for what button you should be pressing at every prompt. So anyway, I'll go ahead and press up, down, left, right, start, select, and then A, B, X, Y, and then L, and then R. Now at this point, it's asking me to press the left trigger button, but I only have the L and R buttons. Left trigger, right trigger would be akin to L2 and R2 if it was, for example, a PlayStation gamepad. But as you can see, I don't have enough buttons at this point. So I can hold down any button to skip the current selection, and I'll just do it again. So I'll have that one, and then again, and then again. And I'm going to keep going because now it's asking me to press the analog joystick in the various directions, which of course I don't have. So I'll skip all of these in my case. And then don't skip the last one here where it says hotkey enable. For that, if you don't have a dedicated button you would like for the hotkey, just press select. And with everything done, I could press the A button, give it a few seconds and then the screen should go to the main menu. And there we are, we have the RetroPie menu, and the controller should work. I could press the A button to go into this menu right here, for example, and then the B button to go back. And we don't have any menu items here for the various game emulators like Super Nintendo or Sega Genesis, because it only shows a selection for emulators that you have ROMs on the SD card for, so what I'm going to show you guys how to do next is to go ahead and configure the RetroPie for adding ROMs. So when it comes to adding ROMs to your RetroPie, unfortunately I can't provide you the download links to download those as it's somewhat of a legal gray area. But if you just go on Google and search for name of system ROMs, for example, Super Nintendo ROMs, You'll probably find what you're looking for, but even if I could give you direct links, these sites have a tendency to go down, so just try your best to find them, and you should, if you are good at Google, have no problem getting the download sites that you need to get those ROM images that make the games work. So go ahead and download the ROMs, and I'll show you how to add those to your RetroPie. Now be careful, a ROM should never end in .exe. So if you go to download a ROM and it has a .exe file extension or it's asking you to download a download manager, browser extension, anything weird, don't. Some people out there kind of put some malicious things out there pretending like they're ROM sites and they're not. So just be careful what you download and you should be fine. Another thing you may need is in the form of BIOS images. Some systems like Game Boy Advance work better if you have the BIOS image which is also something I can't give you a download link for, but you'll just have to Google to find. And Sega CD, PlayStation, and a number of other emulators will require BIOS images as well. But go ahead and search for those if you need to. The RetroPie documentation will tell you what you need. Generally speaking, Game Boy, Game Boy Color, Super Nintendo, Nintendo, Sega Genesis do not need that. I have needed it for PlayStation. Uh, I think PC Engine CD needs it. Game Boy Advance, as I mentioned before, so there's a few. Again, consult the RetroPie documentation if you're at all curious about that. But, you know, at this point, I need to show you guys how to connect your RetroPie to wireless because it just makes adding ROMs to your RetroPie all that much easier to do. 
So here at the RetroPie menu, I could press the A button, and then there's actually an option if I scroll down here for Wi-Fi, so I'll go ahead and press the A button on that. Now this is actually something you will need a keyboard for because we are going to need to enter the password for our wireless network. And it's just easier to do that with a keyboard. Actually, you can't enter the password without a keyboard. So what you'll do is grab a spare keyboard and plug it into one of the USB ports so that we can continue on with the next step. Now obviously any USB keyboard will work just fine. But I have here my favorite keyboard that's a standard non-mechanical keyboard that has ever been made. This is the Dell SK8115. I mean, look at this keyboard. This is just awesome. I love this thing. It's really old, but you know, I just figured if there's any excuse to show off this keyboard in one of my videos, I may as well do that. So I'm gonna go ahead and plug it into my RetroPie unit right here. We should be good to go. And there we go. So I'll go ahead and use the keyboard to go ahead and go through the next screens and you'll do the same on your end and we'll get this thing set up on Wi-Fi. Now before we can continue though, it's basically prompting us to set the Wi-Fi country, which is a prerequisite for Wi-Fi to function at all. So I'll press the left arrow and then enter on yes. I'll go down here to localization options. And the last item here is change Wi-Fi country. So I'll just go down to that and press enter. And then I'll press the down key until I find my Wi-Fi country. And in my case, United States, I'll press enter. Enter again. Then next I'll go to the network options. Enter. Then of course, Wi-Fi and enter. And then what you do right here is you type the name of your Wi-Fi network. It has to be correct, so just make sure you're typing the right name. Now I have a dedicated network on my end for all of my multimedia devices that I call Galaxy. And then enter. And then it's asking for the password for the Wi-Fi network, which I'll enter here. And then enter again. Now we should be good to go, but what you want to do is kind of give it like 20 or 30 seconds to connect just to make sure that you've given it enough time. And then we can go ahead and verify that we did get it set up. Go ahead and finish. And I just press the tab key twice to go down here to finish. And you could tell on the top here that it's, it's actually showing an IP address. That's why I had you guys wait 20 seconds or so, because if you go back to this menu, too soon you won't see that but it should work so long as you put in the right uh, password and SSID of course I did and you can see I have an IP address here I'll go ahead and exit and now we're back to the RetroPie menu now that we have Wi-Fi set up I recommend you go up here to the RetroPie setup menu I'll press the A button on the controller And I'm going to use the keyboard for this because it's just easier when you're navigating these menus. I'll press enter here. And I want to bring your attention to two items. The update menu, which I'm not going to do right now, allows you to basically update the system. If the RetroPie developers implement any fixes or improvements, which they always do, by updating it, you will get the latest improvements direct from the project. So it's recommended that you go ahead and do that. Now down here where it says configuration slash tools, there's something we can do to make this a lot easier for us later. And that's all the way down here where it shows Samba, which is a basically a utility that will allow you to access the file system on the RetroPie from your computer. So you can go ahead and add games and BIOS files very easily. I'll go ahead and press enter. And we're going to choose the first option here to go ahead and install the RetroPie shares. I'll press enter for that. And that's pretty quick. We could press enter for that. And this step may not be necessary, but I'm gonna go ahead and restart the Samba service just to make sure that everything has been activated. I'll press enter. And then I can press the right arrow to go out, which will take us back to the previous menu. So I'll press the right arrow to go back. 
Now go ahead and exit, which should take us back to the RetroPie menu. Now optionally, we could go ahead and enable SSH. For us Linux people, that's just a very easy way of basically connecting to the RetroPie to make changes or add files. Just another way we can do it. So what we'll do is we'll go back to Raspi Config. We'll go down here to Interfacing Options. I'll press Enter. Go down to SSH. Enter. So would you like the SSH server to be enabled? Well, if you want to, go ahead and do that. I always enable it. If it's not something that you plan on using, you probably shouldn't, but I find it useful. So I'll press Enter. And it's enabled. Now you can notice here that I have black bars along the screen. If you notice that in the RetroPie menu as well, you probably want to disable this little feature here. If I go down to Advanced Options, and I've had to do this on every RetroPie setup on my end, I'll press Enter. And the second option is Overscan. I'll press Enter on that. And it's basically asking, would we like that feature turned on? I always turn this off. I just find that it always fixes the issue. Every single TV I have has these black bars by default. So I'll just go over here, press the right arrow, and then enter on no, and then press OK. I'll press the right arrow to go to finish. It's asking if we would like to reboot. I will go ahead and do that just to make sure the overscan option is disabled. And now it's starting back up again, so it should be pretty quick, and we should be good to go to go to the next step. And here we are. So the next step that I'm going to show you guys is how to add ROMs to the RetroPie so we can actually play some games on this thing. So let's go ahead and check out that process right now. Okay, so what I'm going to do right now is plug in my computer to the screen recorder and show you guys the process of adding ROMs to the RetroPie. Since we've enabled Samba, it's actually pretty easy, so let's go ahead and get to it. Okay, so here I am on my laptop, and the process is very similar regardless of which operating system you're using, because pretty much every operating system supports the ability to navigate to a Windows file share, which is essentially what Samba is. So what you'll do is open a file manager. And here we have the file manager right from where I showed you guys the downloaded files and how to set that up. So now what we want to do is find the section on our file manager window where we will go to browse network shares. This varies from one operating system to another but it's very similar regardless. So look for something that says network shares or something like that. In my case, I'll select other locations. And you can see here that the RetroPie unit just showed up on the list. It wasn't there before. So off camera, I had to basically join it to a different Wi-Fi network because I remember now that if you want to share files with it, you probably should be on the same LAN. So I had to go ahead and switch the RetroPie over to the proper Wi-Fi network. And now that I've done that, it's showing up here on the list. So I should be able to double click on RetroPie. And we can see that we have some file shares here that we can use to go ahead and add files to the unit. Now we have the ROMs folder right here. I'll go ahead and connect as anonymous. And we have a list of systems here, basically a folder for each of the supported systems out of the box. So I'll scroll down here. And we can see we have quite a few supported systems. So what I'm going to do is add some Sega Genesis games, also known as Mega Drive, pretty much everywhere else if you're not in the USA. Notice we have a Mega Drive folder right here. And then we also have a Genesis folder as well. It doesn't matter where you put the Genesis slash Mega Drive games, they will show up in the same place. The Genesis folder is basically linked to the Mega Drive folder, so it really doesn't matter. So I'll go ahead and click on Mega Drive here, just double click, and we can see that the folder is actually empty. So now we have the folder open where we're going to put the Genesis games. We actually need some games to put there. Again, these are called ROM files. I can't help you with where to find these, but again, a Google search will probably definitely 
point you in the right direction. Just make sure you don't download an executable file or a download manager like I mentioned. Now off camera, I've already downloaded some files, so I'm gonna go ahead and show you those. Just open up my downloads folder in a new tab here. And I have some new files here that weren't here before. For example, Sonic the Hedgehog and Vector Man. These are actually Sega Genesis games or Mega Drive games for the rest of you. And the file extensions can sometimes vary. I've, I've seen these in other file extensions. .md, you know, short for .mega drive, is pretty common. So what I'm going to do is just select both of these files. I'm going to cut these. And then I'm going to paste them right here in the Mega Drive folder, just like that. And now we have those two games on our RetroPie. In addition to that, I also wanted to show you guys the process of adding a ROM for another system and also a BIOS file as well. So GBA, we don't have any games there for the Game Boy Advance, but in my downloads directory, I do. I have Final Fantasy VI Advance for the Game Boy Advance. One of my favorite games ever. Definitely want to make sure this one is on there. So I'll go ahead and cut so I can move that file over here to the GBA folder. And now Final Fantasy VI is on the RetroPie, but you know, we need a BIOS file for this to make it work the best. So we'll go ahead and go back a little bit further. And notice that we have a BIOS folder right here. I'll double click on it. Again, I'll connect anonymously to the share. There's already going to be some files there. Let's leave those alone. Now in my downloads directory, I have this file selected right here, gba underscore bios dot bin. That's what you could expect to find. And bios files generally don't have any variation on the file name. So if you wanted the Game Boy Advance bios file, you should be able to search for exactly this file name. Maybe there'll be, there might be some variations, but I doubt it. I'll go ahead and cut this. And then I'll go ahead and paste it right here in this folder. And we should be good to go. So now what I'm going to do is switch my screen recorder over to the RetroPie, and we're going to see how to activate these new games that we've added. So here on the RetroPie screen, you'll notice that we don't have anything new. We don't have a Sega Genesis or Mega Drive menu, and we don't even have the Game Boy Advance menu either. So for this, we need to go ahead and restart Emulation Station because it detects newly added games when Emulation Station starts. So I'll press start, then I'll go down to quit and press the A button. And then I'll press the A button again on restart emulation station. And then I'll confirm yes. And now we have two more options that we didn't have before, Game Boy Advance and Sega Mega Drive. So I'll choose Mega Drive. Let's see what we have here. We have Sonic the Hedgehog and Vector Man. So let's check out Sonic. It was made by Sega, in case you didn't already know. And start, let's check it out. Some actual gameplay from the RetroPie itself. How awesome is that? Now the screen recorder is going to have some lag, as you can see. I just died here. I promise I'm not that bad at this game. I'm actually kind of decent at it. But a screen recorder is not the kind of thing you want to use to play a game because of the lag. And that's not something that you can expect to see on your end. It should actually run very, very well. And of course, for me, it's going to be a little bit hard to play with that uh, screen lag here. So I can press Start and Select to exit the game. Then we can check out Vector Man. So here we go. Let's see if this works. And if we were upset that the Sega promo in the Sonic the Hedgehog game was too loud, we could take our frustration out on the Sega logo here. But I'll press Start. Enough of that. This is a really fun game. I love it. Probably one of my favorites on the system. There's actually a sequel to this one as well. I think I kind of like the first one better, but they're both pretty good. Start the game. Skip the intro there. And here we are. 
It's actually a pretty cool, uh, pretty cool looking game here for the Sega Genesis in this time period. I think they were trying to compete with Donkey Kong Country at the time, but I could be wrong on that. I think it was around the same time, but you get the idea. It seems to work just fine, even if I am a klutz there. So I'll press the B button to go back, and then we have the Game Boy Advance menu here, which only has Final Fantasy VI right now. Now, if this works, then we should see the Game Boy Advance logo when we start the game that tells us that the BIOS file is in the right spot. And there we go. We see the animated Game Boy Advance logo there. The BIOS file is fine. That's pretty cool. And now we officially have the best game in all of existence. Final Fantasy VI, right here on the system, and the game Chrono Trigger is the only one that even comes close to this. You definitely have to make sure that Final Fantasy VI, at least one of the versions, is on your system here. Start a new game, because of course I don't have a save file here quite yet. And the game is running, so now we have the intro, so we know that everything is working just fine. But I'm not going to go ahead and play the whole intro, you get the idea. This game is fully functional and we now have it on our system. So that's pretty much the process of setting up RetroPie. But there's one more thing that I want to show you guys before I close the video, and that is the process of installing the safe shutdown script for your case. So back here on the laptop, we have, well, the file manager on the screen that we were using here just previously. Now this is a little bit more advanced because we need to use SSH to configure this. So what you're going to want to do is make sure that you have the SSH service enabled, which I showed you earlier in the video. And then what you'll do is open up a terminal. And even on Windows and Mac OS, there's also a terminal application available. I'll leave it up to you to find it. If it's Mac OS, it should be in your utilities folder, if I remember correctly. And on Windows, you'll probably need to install something like uh, services for Linux or whatever they're deciding to call it these days. Basically, just Google Linux Terminal for Windows or Terminal for Mac OS if you are using something else. So I made the font size a bit bigger here. And what we need to do is SSH into the Raspberry Pi. So I'll do SSH, Pi for the user, at, and then the IP address of the RetroPie, which you can get from your router or whatever you have. If you have basically DNS set up, you should be able to just do something simple like this, Pi at RetroPie, which is not going to work in my case because I made a mistake, long story. So what I'm going to do is type in the IP address. I'll say yes. Then the password by default is Raspberry. Pro tip, if you want this to work, you do have to type that correctly. And now we have an SSH session open to the actual RetroPie device itself. Now, the script I'm going to show you guys is specific to the Argon 1 case. So if you are using a different case, don't do this. There's going to be some documentation that came with the case that'll tell you which one you should be installing. So in the case of the Argon 1 case, the command that you will need to run is actually in the instruction booklet, but I'll go ahead and type it here. So what we're gonna do is type curl, And then the URL that is in the instructions. And I'm going to pipe that to sudo bash and then press enter. And it's going to go ahead and install the required software that makes the power button in the back function properly. This is known as safe shutdown which basically allows us to easily shut down the system with the power button, which is a lot better than just cutting the power, which is something you can't really do. 
It basically makes it act just like a standard computer when you press the power button, which is definitely good to have. Not required, but it's a great feature to have. And it's already done. So what we can do now is restart the unit, and that will basically allow us to go ahead and start using that feature. Since we're already in an SSH session, we could simply do sudo reboot and then press enter. Switch the screen recorder now and watch this boot up. And now the RetroPie is ready to go. The safe shutdown feature is also installed. So just like before, we could simply press the power button to turn it on. And then we could simply hold down the power button for about three seconds, which will activate the shutdown process, which I'll do right now. One, two, three, there we go. And that safely shut it down. I didn't even need to pick up the controller or anything. It's already good to go. So there you go. That was my updated video on setting up RetroPie, this time on the Raspberry Pi 4. I hope that was helpful for you guys. Now from here, you can go ahead and check out the RetroPie documentation because there's additional tweaks and things you could do to configure and customize your RetroPie console further. And be sure to check out the links in the description below the video where I will have links to all of the products that I talked about today in case you want to build yours similar to how I've built mine in this video. So go ahead and subscribe if you haven't already done so, and I will see you in the next video. <laughs>